Good morning. Uh, the subcommittee will now come to order, and uh, we're going to give our opening statements. And at this time, I'd like to recognize the chairman of the full committee for uh, his opening statement, Mr. Upton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, allowing me to go out of turn, uh, uh, but I do appreciate this hearing today. It's very important. And dating back to my days at OMB under President Reagan, I've always been very deeply concerned about the harm that can come from excessive federal regulations. And with each passing day that unemployment remains above 9%, we see the EPA's unprecedented regulatory burden causing genuine hardships for the American people. And as the saying goes, you can't work in a factory that never gets built. Because of the economic damage that comes from some such ill-advised regs, President Obama himself recently decided to withdraw EPA's proposal to revisit the ozone rule. That single proposal had the potential to be the most expensive environmental reg in his history. And I'm pleased to see that it was taken off the table. However, we have to recognize that there are many other proposed and recently finalized regs that also pose a real threat to jobs in the economy, certainly in my state of Michigan and all across the country. Today, we're going to address two sets of regs, those impacting the cement industry and those affecting boilers used in manufacturing, commercial, and institutional settings. These regs pose a real, clear, and present danger to job creation, which is why the two bills under consideration today, the Cement Sector Reg Relief Act and EPA Regulatory Relief Act, need to become law. Let me give one example of how these regs, as they are currently conceived, are directly undermining the shared goal of job creation. President Obama signed a massive stimulus bill at the, end, at the beginning of his term, and much of which was directed towards major infrastructure projects. And as he continues to advocate for building roads and bridges to spur hiring, it takes cement, I would note, to make that infrastructure. Yet EPA's original Cement MAC proposal imposed an unprecedented regulatory burden on the industry. Even EPA admitted that the original cement rules would have caused plant shutdowns and raise the cost of cement. In other words, it would have been a boon to the Chinese and Mexican and other cement industries, not here in the U.S., but a real drag at home. So given the importance of cement in the economic recovery, this is clearly not the way we should be treating an industry and a product so vital to any turnaround. These bills are about common sense, pro-jobs approach to regulations. They simply require EPA to promulgate cement plant and boiler regs that reduce emissions using reasonable and achievable targets and timetables. It's no surprise that both of these bills do enjoy bipartisan support. I look forward to their approval by the subcommittee today, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Upton. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas for a three-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the mark up today. We have two bills before us, H.R. 2250, the EPA Regulatory Relief Act of 2011, and H.R. 2681, or the, the Cement Sector Regulatory Relief Act of 2011. I have concerns with both bills, and I hope my colleagues agree they need to be changed before the bills are approved by the full committee. My first concern with both of these bills is the possibility of indefinite delay in the rules. The EPA says they can finish the boiler MAC rules by next spring, so the 15-month at minimum delay seems unnecessary to me. If we're trying to give our companies regulatory certainty, how are we helping by not setting a date that they can then expect the rules to be issued? How are they supposed to plan for years in advance? I'm also concerned with the bill's requirement that EPA select the least burdensome of the range of regulatory alternatives, even if more stringent standard is feasible and economically viable and provide greater public health protection. I don't want the companies in my district to go out of business or remove production, so I want to ensure they can meet whatever standards are issued. If a more stringent standard is shown to be feasible and economically viable, then according to the Clean Air Act, that is a standard that should be required. This is how we've cleaned up our air over the last several decades and pre protected public health. Health. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope we can address these concerns before our full committee mark. I'm going to yield back. Thank you. I'll recognize myself now for an opening statement. Uh, today we will mark up two important bills, H.R. 2681, the Cement Sector Regulatory Relief Act, and H.R. 2250, the EPA Regulatory Relief Act, which I will refer to as the cement and boiler bills, respectively. I would like to thank my colleague, Mr. Sullivan, for sponsoring the cement bill and Mr. Griffith for sponsoring the boiler bill. I would also like to thank Mr. Ross 
of Arkansas and Mr. Butterfield of North Carolina, the full committee for their sponsorship of these bipartisan bills. Neither the cement nor the boiler bill was part of the President's job speech last week, but should have been, as, those, as these bills clear away impediments and obstacles to job creation. The President did express his support for infrastructure projects as a source of jobs and a means to jumpstart the economy. What he did not say was that the main component of those roads, bridges, buildings, and other infrastructure projects is cement. It makes little sense for the administration to encourage infrastructure on the one hand while saddling the cement industry with costly regulations on the other. But this is precisely what the EPA's original cement MAC rules would have done. Even EPA admitted that its proposal would have led to the closure of several facilities and would have raised the cost of the cement used in construction and would have increased the amount of cement imported into the U.S. The cement industry itself predicted that up to 20 percent of domestic production would have shut its doors in favor of these imports from countries that do not impose such costly regulations on their cement producers. To its credit, EPA has recognized that its initial proposal was technologically and economically unrealistic and has decided to reconsider it. However, this process is fraught with uncertainty whether it will provide the relief needed by domestic cement producers. In order to end this chilling effect, we need to pass this cement bill. This modest bill does nothing more than what EPA should have done all along. It requires the agency to set new emission limits from cement plants that are reasonable and achievable. And I'm convinced that we can do so in a matter that avoids serious economic damages, and this bill would put us on the track to accomplish precisely that. The story with the boiler bill is much the same, but the threat to jobs is even greater because these rules would apply to a wide variety of establishments, not just manufacturers, but also colleges, universities, hospitals, municipal buildings, and commercial properties. Approximately 200,000 boilers would have been affected by these costly rules. Not only would they have adversely impacted job creation, but they would also hurt consumers in the form of higher costs for manufactured goods, as well as things like medical bills, tuition, and rent. The impact on higher education was particularly noteworthy. At hearings, we learned from representatives of Purdue University and Notre Dame University that what these rules would do to them. Both institutions fear multi-million dollar compliance costs at a time when their budgets are already under strain and tuition hikes are the last thing that families can afford at this time. As with the cement rule, the EPA is currently reconsidering the boiler rules, but the agency acting on its own is not likely to fix the problem. The boiler bill requires EPA to repropose its boiler rules so as to be both technologically achievable and economically viable. Both these bills restore the balance between our nation's economic goals of job and job creation and protecting the health and environment of our country. And I would urge uh, every member to support both of these bills. This time I'd like to recognize for an opening statement the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. And today we are marking up two bills, H.R. 2250, the so-called EPA Regulatory Relief Act of 2011, and H.R. 2681, the Cement Sector Regulatory Relief Act of 2011. Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, when the minority staff tried to reach out to the majority side to see if we could work together and come up with a bill that both sides could fully support, those efforts were shamefully rebuffed. As these bills are written, I cannot support either H.R. 2250 or H.R. 2650. 81, because in the words of the Assistant Administrator uh, Gina McCarthy in the subcommittee's hearing last week, these bills would, and I quote, be a direct attack at the core 
of the Clean Air Act, end of quote. Currently drafted, these bills would indefinitely delay the deadline for when EPA would need to act on the rules. Additionally, the language in Section 5 requires EPA to select the, quote, least burdensome, end of quote, of the range of regulatory alternatives, even if more stringent standards is feasible, economically viable, and would provide greater public health protection. Whether intentionally or not, this provision raises legal uncertainty. Since the industry could then argue before the courts that this new language should modify or supersede provisions of the Clean Air Act designed to achieve maximum reductions in toxic air pollution. Ranking Member Waxman and I both showed interest in trying to, ha in trying to hammer out an appropriate compromise with the majority that will address industry concerns while also providing public health and environmental protections. Since these efforts were rejected, I am compelled to oppose both H.R. 2250 and H.R. 2268, and I ask my colleagues to oppose them as well. As I stated in last week's hearing, I believe that protecting the public health should be the absolute top priority of this Congress. But I also believe that we should, that we should work hard and must, must work hard to find the appropriate balance and establish an environment where industry can also succeed and industry can flourish. And I don't subscribe to the belief that we are only capable of doing one or the other. While I realize that not all of our colleagues believe in the merits of science, the experts and the research tells us that we must protect the public health from the toxic air pollutants that are generated from 200,000 plus industrial, commercial, and institutional boilers across the country. Mr. Chairman, the research also tells us that low-income families and minorities are dis disproportionately affected by toxic air pollution because they are more likely to live closer to these industrial facilities. The hazardous air pollutants emitted from these boilers, including mercury and other harmful toxins, can impair brain development, neurological function, and the ability to learn, as well as potentially causing cancer. These toxins can also lead to respiratory and cardiovascular disease by by damaging the kidneys, damaging the lungs, and damaging the nervous system. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> this is what science tells us. And just because we might not like what the science says does not mean that we should disregard scientific fact and evidence and conclusion. So, Mr. Chairman, you leave me with no other choice but to oppose H.R. 2250 and 2631, and I indeed urge all of my colleagues to oppose them as well. I thank you. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rush. At this time, I'd like to recognize the Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Barton of Texas, for a five-minute opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you and Ranking Member Rush for scheduling this markup. It's good to go through regular order and give everybody on the committee an opportunity to review these bills and offer amendments uh, at subcommittee and then later on uh, perfect them at full committee. Uh, I'm going to focus most of my remarks on the Cement Sector Regulatory Relief Act 
uh, although I am in strong support of the um, H.R. 2250, the uh, uh, regulatory, EPA Regulatory Relief Act of 2011. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have three cement plants in my congressional district near a small town in Ellis County called Middle Othian, Texas. Um, they represent a cross-section of the cement industry uh, in, I would say, in the world, actually. One plant is uh, locally owned, uh, one plant is owned by a national corporation, and one plant is owned by an international corporation. Collectively, these three plants employ directly uh, over a thousand uh, men and women. They have provided, uh, m not all, but I would say 60 to 70 percent of the uh, cement that's been used to build the North Texas region over the last 30 years, uh, which is one of the, or 40 or 50 years, which is one of the most uh, uh, economically robust uh, regions, not just of Texas, but of our country. Um, the proposed uh, cement um, regulations, uh, if, if implemented on the timetable as proposed, will probably shut down at least one and maybe two of those plants. They'll certainly restrict the output um, in, for no good purpose, so far as I can tell, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't know if everybody has this in their packet, but this is a, a, a chart of uh, cement consumption in the United States from 1975, and it's extrapolated out to 2030. And if you can see right here this, this huge, just absolute drop, um, we have lost somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of our market uh, since it looks like about 2004. Five, maybe 2006, um, if we lost 40 to 50 percent of our votes, Mr. Chairman, we wouldn't be here. Somebody else would be sitting in these seats at the, at, up here on the, um, on the dais. This rule, if implemented and uh, in the time frame and in the manner as proposed, uh, will cost more next year than the entire profits of the industry in the United States the entire profits. Now this is an industry that's lost 40 percent of its sales. You know, some companies doing a little better, some companies doing a little bit, little, little bit worse. And if we do what the EPA wants to do on the cement industry, they have to spend more than they actually have in profits. That's ridiculous, given the fact that ambient air quality in the United States is going up. It's improving. If we walk outside right now, the sky's blue, the air's good, and there's a power plant less than two blocks from this building. Uh, there's a major thoroughfare, uh, Independence Avenue, a half a block from this room. You know, American technology and American industry and American people are doing a good job on air quality, Mr. Chairman, and we have an EPA that appears you know, absolutely determined to drive our economy in the ground for some theoretical benefit in terms of preventable premature deaths, most of which come from an assumption that you reduce the particulate matter in the PM 2.5, which most of us in Texas call it dust, and, uh, and you'll have better health. So the, the, the Cement Regulatory Relief Act, Mr. Chairman, does not gut the Clean Air Act. It gives the industry more time to comply. It asks the EPA to go back and look at the rule. And in Section 5 of, of the proposed act before us, it says, let's make sure that whatever rule we proposed can be implemented. What a novel idea that we actually try to implement. We try to propose rules that industry can implement and, and do so in a consistent fashion and stay in business. If we're really about saving jobs, Mr. Chairman, then we ought to pass this bill and send it to full committee. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Uh, Mr. Doyle, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, I'll, I'll be brief, Mr. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I won't be voting for either of these bills today, and I think both of them, uh, as they're currently written, have no chance of passing in the Senate. So. The result is nothing gets done. 
Uh, I think there are problems with these rules. And, uh, and I don't have any problem at all with the section of the bill that gives 15 months to repropose these rules. I think industry and EPA, uh, that industry has some legitimate concerns with the rules. And uh, I think they ought to sit down and try to work those things out. The thing that I can't support uh, is this compliance timeline of five years to infinity. Uh, it seems to me that there, there's no guarantee that these, these uh, rules, once they're worked out, would ever be complied with. Um, I don't think that's a bill that's going to clear the Senate, and we'll be right back to square one. So my hope is, uh, is that we can work together uh, from subcommittee to full committee uh, and perhaps come back with a vehicle uh, that allows industry to address some of the legitimate concerns they have with EPA on these proposed rules. Uh, and then once that's done, uh, set some sort of a definitive timeline for compliance uh, that makes sense also. I think if we can do that, uh, then you have a chance of, of a, getting a bill that not only would have bipartisan support here in the House, but could also perhaps clear the Senate. And uh, I am open to working with uh, all members of this committee uh, and, and the subcommittee between now and full committee to try to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shinkus, is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just in a quick response to my friend from Pennsylvania, the Boiler Mac bill is almost identical to a bipartisan bill on the Senate side by Wyden and Collins. And so I would encourage, I, I would, uh, I would uh, be more um, optimistic than pessimistic on the Boiler Mac. Um, just because of uh, that bipartisan support on that side. And I, I just want to reiterate what uh, uh, ranking, I mean, Chairman Barton, Emeritus Barton said on the, wouldn't it be unique that we actually propose rules that we know the industry could meet? Um, both of these bills ask for us to consider rules that are achievable by real world boilers or achievable by cement manufacturing. How unique. Figure out something that, that industry could actually do, because if they can't do it, and I have a huge cement facility, I've been told what they'll do. They'll, they'll move. They'll just disassemble it, they'll ship it to China, and then they'll uh, ship cement back. If we push for rules that industry cannot do, and that, that's the real world. The president talks about jobs. These are two great examples of easing the regulatory burden so we can keep and maintain and grow good paying jobs in America. Uh, he also states uh, his um, concern about undue burdensome regulations where these are uh, example A and example B of undue burdensome regulations. And it also complies with his own executive order, the president's executive order number 13563. So for all those reasons, we ought to be doing this. I, I applaud the, the two uh, sponsors of these legislations. I look forward to quickly passing it through the subcommittee and then, and then doing so on the full committee. And I yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Terry, you're recognized for three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Mr. Doyer, good friend, but boy, I'll tell you, if we're going to base our work off of the lack of productivity in the Senate, we might as well just go home. Uh, so uh, uh, I just, in news on CNN this morning, uh, the discussion was 5.1% poverty or 15.1% poverty rate six points over the unemployment rate. So what we're, we're seeing is there's a number of unemployed that aren't being counted or they have an extremely low paying job. Uh, Mr. Shimkus, I too have a cement factory, uh, an Ashgrove facility, literally just yards outside of my district, but in Jeff Fortenberry's, but I was recently on their property. Uh, and they employ well over 100 people in the district. Uh, the cement MAC, uh, EPA has already said that they expect 20% of those plants to go out of business. This is probably going to be one of them. 
Uh, so that's more people that we put into poverty by government regulation and policy, take away jobs. But probably the, the my, most ironic impact of Cement Mac in particular is the president's st uh, speech the other night where he uh, challenged our side of the aisle in particular on infrastructure. And I appreciate we need more interstates and repair our interstates and repair our bridges. Infrastructure is a role of federal government. It is in Article I, Section 8. Uh, it is a responsibility. The irony here is as he calls for more concrete to be used, you shut down the facilities that are the key ingredient, which is cement forcing us to have to look overseas if we're going to do what the president wants. So we put in a stimulus provision where we're going to stimulate job growth in China to import the infrastructure to us to use. It doesn't make sense to me. So we aren't talking about rolling back. What we're trying to do is block an impossible rule, a new rule, an additional rule that moves the goal line to a point that they can't make. It's maximal, maximal achievable uh, control technology. Not industry standard, but the pipe dream. And that's what we're fighting against today, is saving those jobs. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek to make an opening statement? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. These bills represent a toxic assault on public health for the benefit of corporate polluters and amount to yet another gag order on the EPA. They are part of Republican efforts to deny the science, delay the regulations, and deter efforts to protect the health of millions of Americans. Some might say that Republicans just don't want regulatory decisions to be made. After all, these regulations to reduce hazardous air pollutants are already 10 years overdue, and these bills would allow EPA to postpone them indefinitely. But it turns out that Republicans sometimes want to speed up the bureaucratic rules. Republicans voted to tell EPA to hurry up and make decisions to issue air permits for drilling rigs off the coast of Alaska. Republicans have also voted to give the Department of Interior just 30 days after receiving a permit application to reach a regulatory decision on drilling in the Gulf. And they've also voted to reduce the time allowed for environmental review so that the State Department would approve the Keystone Pipeline as soon as possible. And we hear frequently that the nuclear renaissance uh, could transform from fantasy to reality if the Nuclear Regulatory Commission just sped up its nuclear regulatory review. But when it comes to regulations that would decrease the amount of toxic pollutants in our air or our water, apparently these same agencies just need more time to figure out how to clean it up more time to review the science, more time to understand the technologies, more time before doing anything to make our water safer to drink, make our air safer to breathe, and protect the health of children around the country. In the case of the bills being considered today, this is an indefinite postponement on top of the already decades-long delay since these regulations were supposed to be finalized uh, uh, long ago. For all the 10 long years, industry knew that these rules were overdue. It is all part of an effort to transform EPA into a see no pollution, hear no pollution, speak no pollution agency. EPA's final mercury and air toxic standards for cement plants alone are estimated to save as many of, as 2,500 lives every year. The standards also will prevent up to 17,000 cases of aggravated asthma, 1,500 heart attacks, 32,000 cases of upper and lower respiratory sy sy uh, symptoms, and 130,000 days of lost work annually by the year 2013. When you combine the benefits of the cement rule 
with the benefits of the boiler rule, the enormous public health benefits are undeniable. If these standards were to be delayed by even a single year, the potential magnitude of extreme health consequences would include 9,000 premature deaths, 58,000 asthma attacks, 5,500 heart attacks, and 6,000 hospital admissions and emergency room uh, visits. These bills are both unnecessary and unwise. I urge a no vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time I recognize the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, Mr. Sullivan, for three minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield. Thank you for holding this important subcommittee markup today. Both the EPA's Regulatory Relief Act and the Cement Sector Regulatory Relief Act of 2011 seek to do what we need most, and that is to put a stop to the overburdensome regulations that destroy jobs. Instead of a command and control approach from EPA on environmental regulations, these bipartisan bills will force EPA to rewrite these burdensome rules so they are both technically and economically achievable while protecting American jobs. Specifically, I, I introduced the Bipartisan Cement Act legislation with my good friend and colleague Mike Ross to prevent U.S. cement plant shutdowns, which will directly result in job losses. The President recently submitted a jobs plan to Congress, and I want to be clear, this bill is about jobs and we, he should support it. If EPA's Cement Act rule is not revised, thousands of jobs will be lost due to the cement plant closures and inflated construction costs. This rule also threatens to shut down 20 percent of the nation's cement manufacturing plants in the next two years, sending thousands of jobs permanently overseas and driving up cement and construction costs across the country. Cement is the backbone for the construction of our nation's buildings, roads, bridges, tunnels, and critical water and wastewater treatment infrastructure. My legislation has wide bipartisan industry support from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, as well as the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers, iron shipbuilders, blacksmith forgers, and helpers. Mr. Chairman, these EPA cement and boiler regulations negatively affect business and job creation in every community. These two rules will cost our nation billions, impacting everything from energy reliability, jobs, manufacturing, and the global economic competitiveness of the United States. The Boiler Mac rule alone has the potential to put 224,000 jobs at risk while costing $2.3 billion annually to our economy. For both of these bills, our goal is to ensure effective regulations that protect communities both environmentally and economically while protecting jobs. With the nation's unemployment rate above 9 percent, the time is now to pass these bills, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to bring them to the House floor. And I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess, for three minutes for his opening statement. I thank the chairman for the recognition. You know, President Obama acknowledged at the beginning of this month that the EPA kills jobs. He demanded Lisa Jackson revoke her extreme new ozone standards rule. So the president is now on the same page with House Republicans. This EPA is out of control. This EPA is the largest contributor to economic uncertainty in the federal government. This president finally got it right. This EPA kills jobs, and its policies need to be contained. And the legislation we're reviewing today doesn't even go that far. These two bills simply return to the agency for consideration the collection of rules that economists and scientists have told us will kill jobs, hurt energy production, and not provide one scintilla of improvement in the air that we breathe. So this is a reasoned approach. I was under the impression that all agencies, all agencies were required to review their regulations for their toxic effect on employment. Apparently Lisa Jackson didn't get that memo. And that's why the White House had to scrap the ozone rule. I hope that the White House will review the rest of the EPA's extreme regulations. But if the President refuses to do so, it's important to note that this committee will do the job that he refuses to do. Now, you want to talk about harming human health? How about you talk about the men and women who've lost their job due to these toxic EPA regulations? Talk about families that are now dependent upon the government for nutrition or health care as opposed to having a fulfilling em employment? How about people whose energy bills are so high that maybe their loved ones, maybe an elderly loved one is put at risk in extreme temperatures of either hot or cold? 
This EPA's regulations are affecting people's health, just not in the way that Lisa Jackson would claim. I think we ought to move these bills quickly and get the men and women in this country back to work. That's our focus today, tomorrow, and until the Obama unemployment totals are a thing of the past. I'll yield back the balance of my time. This time I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray, for three minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, a lot of my um, perceptions of this bill is much like Mr. Doyle's. Um, I think that, you know, um, fair people can disagree on strategies and timing. I take a back seat to no one on this committee with a background on clean air. I challenge that anywhere along the line. I think that as an individual, I've been looking for years, waiting for a lot of these regulations to be implemented. But the fact is, priorities have to be made. And there is a crisis out there. There may be major concerns by um, some scientists about the air emissions from these industries. But the one thing that is not questionable is the crisis in jobs right now. And frankly, the concept that somehow government regulations and rules have no effect on the economic opportunities for our working class people is absolutely absurd. And I think it's quite clear our responsibility at looking at the appropriate level and timing for implementation of regulations as being essential, especially when you have the administrator of the EPA clearly say in hearing that her job is not to worry about jobs. Well, it's our job to worry about jobs. And it's easy to say for us in California about let's mandate these regulations on people in the Midwest and let's put these regulations in Ohio and Illinois because we've already done it in California. We've also faced a 12% unemployment rate in California at this time. And I just wanted to uh, state again that the statements that this is going to be such an economic boom to require these, these modifications um, may sound great at a hearing in, in Washington, but you come out to San Diego, come out to San Francisco, come out to Los Angeles, you take a look at our economic realities of not only the price of energy but the, and the economic downturn, but the fact that cement um, – uh, material and, and the material for construction is being imported from Mexico as we speak with the related mobile source and non-point source emissions not even being considered in the plan. So uh, I, I do have a concern about not implementing these rules, Mr. Chairman, but I have a bigger concern about implementing these rules at a time that the country is flat on its back, that people are out there um, economically flat on its back, that are economically um, in crisis, and we don't want to set priorities. And I would challenge my colleagues to say this. This would be the kind of thing that everybody would want to agree with in certain sectors in the political structure, that we should be borrowing money to do these improvements as part of a stimulus plan. The fact is, we've got to understand that we need to do more than just write blank checks and continue to throw money at the problem. We have an obligation to look at what is government doing to stop the, the ability of the private sector to respond to the economic crisis. And I'll tell you one thing, as somebody who spent, um, you know, 18 years working regulatory agencies, we need to look at what we're doing everywhere and do more than just look. The president promised to do something. We ought to start taking some action. And I regretfully will support this bill um, because I think it, there are ways to improve it. But I think that the jobs are more important than any other item at this time, and we need to move forward. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for his three-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership in bringing these two bills before the subcommittee. I'm happy to see that we're moving quickly to act on bipartisan legislation that will provide regulatory certainty to businesses that are trying to create American jobs. As we heard from our expert witnesses during last week's hearing on these bills, several of the Environmental Protection Agency's new rules are impeding our nation's economic recovery effort by placing unrealistic demands on America's job creators. The Boiler Act and Senate rules share many similarities with the proposed ozone rule that President Obama wisely asked the EPA to withdraw. When the EPA hastily wrote the Boiler Act and Cement rule, 
they failed to acknowledge the cumulative impact that these and other major EPA rules would have on industry's ability, ability to innovate and compete in a global market. These rules do nothing to promote predictability and only add to the uncertainty in the marketplace. And this is why I'm hopeful that H.R. 2250, the EPA Regulatory Relief Act of 2011, of which I'm an original co-sponsor, and H.R. 2681, the Cement Regulatory Relief Act of 2011, will be signed into law. These bills will give the EPA the time they requested to correct these seriously flawed rules and help American businesses grow. We cannot control what our colleagues in the Senate choose to do with this legislation, but we can send a message that House members are committed to cutting through the bureaucratic red tape that is hampering job creation. And I may be an eternal optimist, but I hope that the Senate and the President will join us in acting on these bills and these other many job creation bills that we've already passed and will be passing in the coming months. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Olson. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for his three-minute opening statement. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thousands of jobs in the forestry and the paper industry have been put at risk by the excessive, excessive aggressiveness of the EPA. Companies and businesses have been forced to either comply with these regulations in a dismal economic climate or be forced to shut down. One particular company in my district employs 500 people and will be forced to pay $6 million alone just to retrofit their boilers. One firm has already closed its doors in this climate. The affected businesses in my district are pleading with me to delay the rules and revisit the science and the cost-benefit ratio. These companies are already meeting very stringent EPA standards. They're meeting those, and they've reduced their environmental emissions drastically since 1990. Now is not the time to tighten the environmental standards and move the goalposts. Among the Boiler Mac, Utility Mac, Cement Mac, coal ash rules, America is saying enough is enough. The American people are fed up with regulations that threaten their jobs. Remember, last month, not one job was created in America. We're still at 9.1. 14 million of our neighbors are still looking for jobs. Today, we have a bipartisan bill before us. In one small way, maybe it's one step at a time, it will save our nation's economy. Maybe it's one industry at a time, but we've got to start someplace reining in an excessive regulatory body. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for a three-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, H.R. 2250 is a compromise. Like any compromise, the language of the EPA Regulatory Relief Act isn't what I might have done if I were acting alone. However, this language brought together a group of legislators from both sides of the aisle with a reasonable approach and reasonable language, and I am proud to be able to carry and defend this bipartisan compromise language. This bill has 116 co-sponsors, of which 24 are Democrats. We have hundreds of letters of support from businesses, unions, and trade associations. Boiler Mac and Cement Mac are complex areas of law and regulation. We're talking about hundreds of pages in the Federal Registry of very complex rules. Businesses need certainty, and they need to know we're going to get the rules right. These bills simply give us sufficient time to get the rules right when impo imposing such complex expensive, comprehensive rules on businesses that employ thousands of hardworking Americans. Particularly in this economic environment, we need to be sure the rules are right. As EPA told the court last December on Boiler Mac, investments required by these rules are irreversible. For those businesses that decide to stop producing their product at a particular location, the job losses are also irreversible. Let me tell you why this matters particularly to me and to my constituents. We've had a number of businesses and other entities testify at various hearings 
that these pending rules on boiler mac and cement would negatively impact them. Four of these companies employ people in the 9th District of Virginia, Mead West Vaco, Selenese, Titan America, the parent company of Roanoke Cement, Rock 10, many others across the 9th District are also affected, and of course the United States as a whole. These are real people, and these are real jobs that are on the line. The purpose of H.R. 2250 is to clarify Congress's intent that the EPA must set standards that are actually achievable by real-world units. And it's interesting when you look at the language of the actual underlying bill, and I quote, emission standards for existing units in a category may be less stringent than standards for new units in the same category, but shall not be less stringent than the average emissions uh, limitation achieved by the best performing 12 percent of units in the category, excluding units which first met the lowest achievable emission rates 18 months before the date such standards are proposed or 30 months before the date such standards are promulgated, whichever is later. We're at a situation where we're looking at rules that only apply to the 2 percent. I don't think the original intent was that you go from 12 to 2. I think 12 was put in there for a reason. It may not be that you can't go to 10, but I think from 12 to 2 is too big a spread. I don't think the EPA is in, in applying rules that meet the original intent of the legislation. I think the, this new legislation is necessary, and I ask that you pass both bills. This time I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for a three-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you having this markup and, and bringing these bills forward because, you know, when we look out and, and talk to our constituents, talk to people around the country about what they're really concerned about the most, it's jobs. Uh, they want us to be up here focusing on job creation. Uh, and, in fact, when, when I went uh, throughout my district during the August recess, as I'm sure many of my colleagues did, I met with a lot of small business owners, a lot of people who are out there trying to create jobs in this tough economy. And they could create jobs in this tough economy except one big impediment that they all cite. It was a universal, uh, it seemed like a universal theme that all the small business owners I met were talking about. And they said it's the regulations coming out of this administration that are stopping them from being able to create jobs. And EPA is probably the worst culprit. Uh, EPA seems to be on a mission to go after industry after industry, implementing a radical agenda that have absolutely nothing to do with health and safety. And don't take my word for it. Let's just look at the ozone standard that was released a couple of weeks ago uh, by the EPA. Uh, they talked about all these health benefits, and we've heard some of our colleagues on the other side who oppose the legislation today that's brought before us that will roll back uh, some of these radical rules that the EPA is trying to impose on our small business owners. Uh, they talk about health and safety, and they hide behind health and safety as if anybody here is against health and safety. That's ludicrous to suggest that. But, in fact, if you look at what the EPA said about the ozone standard they were trying to go forward with, they said it would stop 380 cases of chronic bronchitis, 243,000 days when people miss work or school that they would prevent, 750,000 days when people must restrict their activities, uh, over 1,000 cases of acute bronchitis they would prevent with their rules and regulations. And was it Republicans that stood in the way of them implementing this rules, these rules that supposedly would do all these great things for health? No, it was President Obama himself who said the EPA is out of control, who said all of these statements that they make about health and safety are not even accurate because do you think the president himself wants a thousand more cases of bronchitis? I don't think President Obama wants to do that. I don't think President Obama wants 243,000 more days missed through sick uh, because the president himself said that these rules under ozone that EPA was trying to go forward with were out of control. And frankly, what we're saying with these two bills on cement boiler mac are that EPA is overstepping their authority in a way that has nothing to do with health and safety but is killing jobs in America. And it's rule after rule and regulation after regulation. We don't need more stimulus bills, more spending of money we don't have, more tax increases on the very small business owners and middle class families that are struggling out there. The trillions of dollars of money on the sidelines that every economist will tell you is out there that could be used to create jobs but can't be because of these radical rules and regulations. Give up this radical agenda. Let's create jobs and stand up for health and safety. And that's why we need to pass these bills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scalise. Um, I think everyone's completed their opening statements. Mr. Waxman, who's the ranking member of the full committee, is on his way. He's been delayed and has asked us to 
give him an opportunity to make an opening statement as well as participate in the debate. So uh, I'm going to recess this uh, markup for 10 minutes, and hopefully at that time he will be here. And so we'll, we'll reconvene at uh, 10 minutes after 11. I'll uh, call this uh, committee markup back to order. And at this time, uh, I'd like to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for his five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As Stephen Perlstein wrote recently in the Washington Post, the bumper sticker for this year's Republican presidential candidates is simple. Repeal the 20th century, vote GOP. Social Security, an institution that provides a critical safety net to seniors, is being falsely labeled a Ponzi scheme. Medicaid and Medicare, which provide essential health care to American families, are under attack. The candidates take turns threatening to shutter the Environmental Protection Agency, the one cop on the beat that can stand up to the big polluters. And this approach doesn't stop with the presidential candidates. This House of Representatives is the most anti-environmental house in history. The House has voted 125 times this Congress to block action to address climate change, to halt efforts to reduce air and water pollution, to undermine protections for public lands and coastal areas, and to weaken the protection of the environment in other ways. Yesterday, I posted a searchable database of these anti-environmental House votes on the committee website. I hope the public will visit democrats.energycommerce.house.gov to examine the radical policies being advanced by the Republicans in the House. Today, the assault continues. This committee considers legislation to gut Clean Air Act provisions that protect American families from toxic air pollution. If the bills we consider today are enacted, we know there will be more cases of cancer, birth defects, and brain damage. We will harm the way our children think and learn. We have long known that toxic air pollutants such as mercury, arsenic, dioxin, lead, and PCBs can cause these serious health effects. In 1990, Congress adopted a bipartisan approach to protect the public from toxics. The new program listed 187 toxic air pollutants and directed EPA to set standards requiring the use of maximum achievable control technology for categories of sources. This approach has worked well. Industrial emissions of carcinogens and other highly toxic chemicals have been reduced by 1.7 million tons each year. EPA has reduced pollution from dozens of industrial sectors, from boat manufacturing to fabric printing, from lead smelters to pesticide manufacturing. But a few large source categories still have not been required to control toxic air pollution due to delays and litigation. These include utilities, industrial boilers, and cement plants. EPA's efforts to finally reduce toxic air pollution from these sources are long overdue. The bills we consider today would block and indefinitely delay EPA's efforts to reduce toxic emissions from two of these major sources. They would also rewrite the MACT standards once again, this time to weaken the protections and set up new hurdles for EPA rules. We're told that these bills simply give EPA the time they requested to get the rules right. That's nonsense. EPA vigorously opposes these bills. We're also told that we need to pass these bills because the threat of EPA regulation is dragging down our economy. That's legislative opportunism at its worst. It was the lack of regulation of Wall Street banks that caused this recession, not environmental regulations that protect children from toxic mercury emissions. Mr. Perlstein wrote, listening to the Republicans talk about the economy and economic policy is like entering into an alternative universe. He's right, and these bills are additional proof. Yesterday, I asked whether the Republican majority would be interested in working on a compromise bill that would give EPA some additional time. 
and clarify when a facility will be considered a boiler and, then it would, and when it will be considered an incinerator. The response was, in effect, we have the votes and don't need to negotiate. You may have the votes in the House, but that doesn't justify a legislative approach that ignores the facts and jeopardizes public health. As these bills move through the committee, I hope we will find the courage to say no to the special interest, to think carefully about the facts and the science, and to do what is right for the American families. Until then, I urge my colleagues to vote no on these extreme bills. And I yield back the second I have left. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Um, are there any further opening statements? Okay. Well, the chair at this time then would call up H.R. 2681 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 2681, to provide additional time for the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to issue achievable standards for cement manufacturing facilities. Without, and for without other objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered. Are there any bipartisan amendments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I have an amendment. I hope that is bipartisan. Okay. <laughs> okay, the gentleman, uh, would the clerk uh, report the amendment? Amendment to H.R. 2681 offered by Mr. Rush at the end of Section 5 and the following. We'll rule out of, without objection, we'll dispense with the reading of the amendment, and I'll recognize the gentleman for five minutes to speak in favor of his amendment. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Chairman, I do uh, really hope that at the end of uh, my statement and on the vote, when we take the vote, that there will be uh, enlightened uh, voting on this particular issue and that it will be bipartisan. Uh, the proponents of this bill argue that it will provide certainty uh, to industry by clarifying how EPA sets standards for toxic air pollution under the Clean Air Act. Section 5 of this bill won't provide certainty, though. It will just promote years and years and years of unnecessary litigation and potentially good, important public health protections. Cement kills are a major source of mercury pollution and other toxic air, air pollution. Until last year, cement kills had managed to avoid any sort of requirement to reduce these emissions. In August, the EPA finalized requirements for these kills to use available technology to cut their uh, pollution. But this bill could take us backwards and allow cement kills to continue polluting uh, the air for years uh, to come. I am particularly concerned about Section 5 of the bill. It requires the EPA to set emission standards for cement kilns that can be, quote, consistently and concurrently, end of quote. It also requires EPA to select the, quote, least burdensome, end of quote, regulatory alternative, even if a stronger standard is feasible and will provide more public health benefits. Words like least burdensome and consistent sound reasonable, but this section could dramatically weaken EPA's ability to require cement kilns to meet emission limits for toxic air pollutants such as mercury and dioxin and other pollutants. Let me tell you the problems with Section 5, the Clean Air Act requires EPA to set air pollution standards for cement kilns based on what cleanest facilities are actually achieving today. It's a practical approach. The law also requires EPA to calculate an emissions 
floor for each toxic air pollutant that reflects emission levels that are being, are being achieved in the real world. Not in the lab, but in the real world. But Section 5 could compel EPA to set emission standards based on the worst performing, most polluting facilities rather than the cleaner facilities that are using available technology to reduce their toxic pollution. That simply does not make any sense. Section, second, Mr. Chairman, this section could lower the bar even more by compelling EPA to choose, quote, the least burdensome regulatory option. Even if this option doesn't go far enough to protect the public health, uh, it compels the EPA to choose the least burdensome option. I've been saying that this bill could gut the Clean Air Act and has the potential to weaken public health protections. That's because the language in the bill isn't clear. Does the bill intend to let polluters off the hook? One question. Or does the bill intend to provide guidance for EPA when it, comes, when it is setting pollution reduction requirements for CPA, for cement kills? This amendment clarifies the intent. It states that the language in Section 5 supplements but does not replace the requirement that EPA sets numeric emission limits to achieve maximum reduction in toxic air and pollution unless such limits are not feasible. Mr. Chairman, this is a good amendment, a common sense amendment, and I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Rush. Uh, I, I will recognize my I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for speaking opposition to the amendment. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, my colleague said supplement but does not replace. The whole idea of this uh, bill is to create certainty by the industrial sector uh, in this uh, aspect of uh, cement plants. And Again, in my opening statement, this is exactly what I talked about in the opening statement, is that uh, we don't want to create confusion. We want to create certainty. And it's not too much to ask that we know that these standards are achievable by real-world facilities, not desktop analysis, not mathematical formulas or equations, but ones that industry can actually achieve. I know it's, it's crazy, but uh, for those people who are employed in these facilities and that have uh, gone to great uh, lengths to expand production, create jobs, continue to pay a good wage, continue to provide health care benefits, uh, our concern is uncertainty breeds uh, a real-world response of closure. And so uh, I ask my colleagues to reject this amendment, and I yield back my time. The gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized for the purpose of speaking on the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I support Mr. Rush's amendment. It address, addresses one of the most egregious provisions in this bill. Section 5 of this bill requires EPA to set emission standards for cement, cement kilns that can be met quote, consistently and concurrently, end quote, with emission standards for all other air pollutants, taking into account a variety of factors. It also requires EPA to set the least burdensome regulatory alternative. On the face, that sounds reasonable, but in actuality, this section would dramatically weaken EPA's ability to require cement kilns to reduce toxic air pollutants such as mercury and di dioxins. At a minimum, it's, it's utterly unclear how the new language interacts with the existing criteria for standard setting. On controversial issues like this, you can be sure there will be uh, uh, this ambiguity will guarantee years, if not decades, of litigation. 
The Clean Air Act requires EPA to set toxic air pollution standards for cement kilns based on the best performers in the industry, the facilities with the lowest emission levels. EPA is not going to base its uh, emission reductions on pie-in-the-sky technologies. The Act requires EPA to calculate an emissions floor for, we, for each toxic air pollutant that reflects emission levels that are actually being achieved in the real world. Section 5 of this bill may gut these public health protections. First, this section could compel EPA to set emission standards based on the worst performing, most polluting facility rather than the best performing facility that is utilizing available technology to clean up its toxic, its toxic pollution. That doesn't make any sense at all. Secondly, this section could compel EPA to choose the least burdensome, which means to reduce toxic air pollution, including so-called work practice standards. Currently, EPA is allowed to substitute a work practice standard, such as an annual tune-up of a facility, only if a numeric emissions limit is not feasible. This section seems to require EPA to choose the less protective option in lieu of meaningful emissions reductions, even if they are feasible and achievable. That doesn't make sense either. I've been saying that the section could gut the Clean Air Act and may weaken public health protections. That's because the language in the bill is not clear. At the hearing last week, Gina McCarthy from EPA testified that this section could raise legal uncertainty because it is not clear whether or not it trumps current law. Environmental lawyers who have been litigating these provisions for decades believe they would trump the current standards. In other words, this section would create more litigation and uncertainty, contrary to what my friend and colleague from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, uh, asserted. If the supporters want to give industry more regulatory certainty, they should support clarifying an obvious and fundamental ambiguity in the bill. And that's what Mr. Rush amendment would do. It simply states that the language in Section 5 supplements but does not replace the requirements that have been in the Clean Air Act for the past 20 years. It clarifies that EPA should set numeric emissions limits to reduce toxic air pollution unless such limits are not feasible. My colleagues have two choices. Support this amendment to cl clarify this bill uh, and not de designed to gut the Clean Air Act or oppose the Russia amendment and admit that the bill goes much further than its supporters claim it does. I urge my colleagues to support the uh, Russia amendment. The uh, gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan, is recognized for five minutes to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sections uh, 112 and 129 direct EPA to set maximum achievable control technology for sources that emit hazardous pollutants. While it should be clear from the, from the statute that these be achievable in practice, courts have created ambiguity. Because of misrepre misrepre re misrepresentation by the courts, EPA is following a pollutant by pollutant approach and setting standards that cannot be met by real world cement plants. This is sometimes referred to as the Franken plant problem. The purpose of H.R. 2681 is to clarify Congress's intent that EPA must set standards that are actually achievable in practice by real-world units. H.R. 2681 specifies the administrator must ensure that the emission standards set can be met under actual operating conditions and can be met at the same time for all pollutants being regulated under the rule. Put simply, Achievable means achievable. This amendment would create confusion for EPA because the agency would have to choose between the existing language in the statute and Congress's clarifications in the, this bill that the standards being set are achievable and practiced by real-world facilities. Ambiguity has kept these rules in litigation since 1999, and it is critical that Congress provide additional direction to EPA. I urge a strong no vote on this amendment. And I yield to uh, Congressman Walden. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I don't think we'd necessarily be here today if the EPA weren't on some jihad against jobs in America. And I say that because they had the opportunity under the 
Clean Air Act to uh, create a subcategory for some of these cement plants. And in fact, there were a number of us uh, who encouraged them to do so for one of these two plants, because it's located in my district, uh, that has invested $20 million in the latest and uh, best technology available to reduce emissions, a carbon injection technology. Despite our various pleas to use the discretion allowed under the Clean Air Act and create a subcategory, the EPA declined. And so as a result, um, you know, it's kind of ironic that today the president's going to be out, I think, in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, talking about jobs. He uh, is after us all the time to vote for a jobs bill that we've only just begun to look at. And yet here he has an agency that is on a jihad against jobs. 107 of them in Baker County out in, in Durkee, Oregon. It's the biggest, uh, I think, private sector employer, certainly uh, in terms of overall payroll and its effect in the county. Uh, in rural Oregon, this plant's been there, I don't know, 20, 30 years probably. They, on their own, without a national standard, uh, invested $20 million to reduce their emissions by more than 90 percent, 9-0. But it so happens the limestone in that area has a little higher content of, of mercury. And they're working to try and even capture more. Now, I don't think there's ever been a case of mercury poisoning in, in Baker County uh, that's documented. I asked the other day when the uh, Assistant Secretary was here for the specific data on their analyses as it relates to Oregon. Uh, a lot of the pollution we get comes through the atmosphere from China. And guess what? You force all this manufacturing offshore, where do you think it's going? It's going to China. And then we get to breathe the unregulated air that's coming over. And, and so the pollutants drop, especially on the West Coast, and we lose the jobs and we get their pollution. Now, that's not a very good prescription for an American renaissance. And so that's why we're here today. We're here to say we've got to do this differently. And if the EPA won't work cooperatively uh, with us on this, then they need different guidance and direction from the United States Congress. And so I, uh, I oppose this amendment, and let's not forget that ambiguity has kept all these rules in litigation since 1999, as it is. So I think it's critical that Congress provide additional direction to the environment. What, what, what is agency. That what is it, I'm you? Uh, I, I'm on Mr. Sullivan's time, so I, I, I would yield. Uh, you, you know, yeah, I he keep hearing about jobs, and uh, uh, I just want you to know that in 1996, the U.S. cement plants employed some 17,900 workers, and they produced 77 tons of Portland slash masonry cement, 17,900. Right. Ten years later, in 06, U.S. plants turned out nearly 100,000 tons, but with a smaller workforce. And this was during the Bush years, during the Bush administration, oh. during the EPA that was under President Bush had less employees, 16,300 employees, almost 1,000 less employees, but with more production. Domestic production has collapsed due to the recession. Oh, oh. Gentlemen's, gentlemen's time has expired. I recognize myself for five minutes, and I yield to the gentleman. Well, I, I, I thank the subcommittee chairman. I'm not sure what the point of my friend from Illinois is, other than the fact there are fewer people working. Uh, in this industry, which neither of us, I would think, would support. And if the EPA has its way, uh, there's likely to be 107 fewer people directly and 654 uh, overall in rural eastern Oregon going to be working for them. So if, if your point is we need more people working in this industry, then join us in this legislation and block the jihad against jobs that's coming out of this EPA that's affecting real-world jobs in the United States. And this does not require some sort of tax increase or bailout. It doesn't require borrowing. It just requires common sense and regulation. And these agencies have lost the sense of common sense. Now, I was a small business owner for 20 years. I've dealt with agencies, not as much as a lot of other small businesses. But I'll tell you what, everywhere I go in my district, and I know many of my colleagues, at least on our side of the aisle, are hearing the same thing. One rule after another after another is either putting businesses out of business or the threat of these rules coming has them frozen because they don't know what it's going to look like 
after 2011, after 2012, or after 2013. So they're saying, I don't know how to plan. I don't know how to invest. Now, if you've never met a payroll and you've never risked your own capital, I don't think you can fully appreciate in your gut what those of us who have feel when you've got a big federal agency on top of you that appears to, when it has discretion, not use it. And, and I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I, I met with some guys that have a, 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 a gravel pit, if you will, uh, in central Oregon. They've been working with the Bureau of Land Management for two and a half months to figure out if they can put gravel on a gravel road for a half a mile stretch so that it doesn't become muddy this winter and prevent them from hauling the rock out to do, to do the get the contract to do the jetty work on the f mouth of the Columbia yeah. River. If they can't get that done, they risk losing this ability to have this contract. And guess where that kind of rock's going to come out of? Canada. Yeah, me, so me. what? No, I won't yield. One after another after another agency is dumping down on small businesses in America and, and putting them at risk, dragging them out. I just met with some people from uh, the town of my Mr. birth, Chairman, Dallas, you, Oregon. You, you, Excuse are me. You, control, you control the time. When would you yield? Well, I, I, I've, I don't want Mr. Walden. Well, I, and I, I, I was just reclaiming. Uh, so I just met with these people from the Dallas, Oregon. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many different projects they have on their port property. They're now being held up by federal agencies over debates, over rules and regulations. Real life jobs. They just had a company that was set to build a facility on their port that it took between state and federal regulators, I think more than a year, to figure out the permitting process. And guess what? That company, Billabong, decided instead to build a plant in Canada. Yeah. And you're, I, you know, you can tell me all you want about how the government's here to help, but in the real world of small business, the, the only help they really want is get the government out of the way. Um, or give them certainty. What the gentleman the legislation what, what, will do both. What, what, I, go back what, what, what to the, I, I control the time, and I'll be happy to yield uh, a minute to the gentleman. Well, well, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, because I mean, you know, this is, I guess, this is uh, ex expediting science that we that we're pertaining to. I mean, you were here during the Bush years. You have not muttered not one mumbling word uh, uh, about the conduct of the EPA during the eight years of the Bush administration. But now the EPA is all of a sudden the jihad of job uh, insecurity or job security now. And I wonder where you were then. Look, the industry, well, let's, 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 let us be, Chairman Yield. let us be clear. The industry Chairman. won't recover until the demand picks up again. If, in fact, you are so uh, supportive of jobs, yep. then why don't you I'll become a, a sponsor of the President Obama's jobs, uh, American jobs? I'm going to re reclaim my time. I will say this, that the unemployment rate certainly was not as high in the Bush administration. And uh, I would yield to the gentleman well, from Oregon. I, I guess the point would be I hope that the economy turns around, and I'm doing my part to try and get it there, and I know you are doing your part from the way you see it. But the point is, if these rules force the, force the closure of a domestic cement plant in my district, it doesn't matter what the economy looks like. The cement's going to come from somewhere else. And that's 107 direct jobs, 650 indirect jobs. My colleague from Nebraska points out, using EPA's own calculations, under these rules, you'd lose, if it's 20% reduction in production, 3,260 jobs. And by the way, during the Bush administration, I fought the same EPA on some of these same Mr. sort of Chairman, category rules. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. Mr. Chairman. For what purposes, the gentleman from California speaking? To strike the last word. Without objection. Am I recognized, Mr. Chairman? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. I don't think there's any unanimous consent to, that's required for me to be able to speak. I do seek to be recognized. I thought that the gentleman had already been recognized to speak on the amendment previously. I spoke uh, to support the amendment. I now speak to strike the last word on the bill. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, let me just point out to my colleagues, uh, you have a different view of the world. You think that the recession that is happening now is uh, something to do with the rules that are being proposed for the future. Small businesses are losing a lot of their employees. They're closing a lot of their plants. 
not because of rules that are in effect that are harmful to them or burdensome to them. It's because of this recession. Now, many of us believe this recession was due to the policies of the Bush administration. And for those of, on this committee that were around during those years, some of the votes they cast to give huge tax breaks, to fund two wars, to fund a, uh, a, an extension of the entitlement under Medicare without paying for any of it. And now we have, in addition to the downturn in the economy, a huge budget deficit. We have a lot of people unemployed. We all want to get people back to work. I must say that I have serious doubts how cutting programs will get people back to work now. That's not to say we don't need to deal with the deficit. But when the states cut back on money for schools, teachers are fired. When they cut back on money for uh, communities and cities, policemen and firemen are fired. If there's no demand for the product of, uh, of manufacturers, the manufacturers start closing up. And if they can get cheaper labor somewhere else, they move somewhere else. That has nothing to do with the environmental rules. Let me just say, since my colleague from Oregon said, nobody can understand this unless you have to meet a payroll. Some of us didn't uh, have the opportunity to be born to a family that had a business for which we then had to make the payroll when we inherited it. Uh, would gentlemen families, yield on that point? I, I'm not yielding. I'm not yielding. You didn't yield, I'm not going to yield. But some of us know families with children who've been exposed to mercury and who have cancer. Some of us know families whose children have a difficult time learning in school because they've been exposed to toxic air pollutants. Some of us have gone to communities where there are chemical plants, and these chemical plants were spewing so much toxic emission in the surrounding community that people had to sleep on a slant and not to, not to drown in their own fluids in their lungs. There are people who suffer from these toxic air pollutants. So to say on the, we should ignore that in order to give a break to small businesses who are hurting because of the recession, it doesn't add up. We should all want to protect from these toxic air pollutants. But the bill that is before us doesn't try to deal with toxic air pollutants. It tries to deal with tying the hands of the Environmental Protection Agency so they're not able to deal with it under laws that were passed by the Congress with bipartisan support. I have no doubt trying to meet a payroll is, is a, a problem, especially in, in a downturn in the economy. I have no doubt it's a problem for businesses to try to figure out how to make sure they're living up to the regulations. But I am certain if there's litigation that goes on and on and on, these people have no idea when they run their businesses what will be expected of them. And I think if you ask them, they want to stop these pollutants as well. And to tell them that there's no such thing as a pollutant, there's no real problem, they should ignore it because they have to meet a payroll, may help them in the short term. But it's not going to help them in the long term. And it's certainly not going to help people who are injured because of these toxic air pollutants. Now I'll be happy to yield to the gentleman from Oregon. And I, just and I want to say that I should not have been so personal, and I regret it. Not only, uh, not only should you not have been so personal regret it, at least you could have been accurate. They did not inherit my business. Well, if I, if I was I wrong about that, I'm pleased to, to uh, be corrected. Well, I would think I would know. <laughs> and you are wrong. And my wife and I purchased our business starting in 1986 from my parents when they sold it to us. And I don't know what the hell that has to do with the debate here anyway other than a personal attack. Well, I don't know what it, yielding, re, re, reclaiming my time, I don't know what it means when you say personally, I had to meet a payroll. I did. And I had a difficult time doing it. I did. Oh, well, you met a payroll. And you were able to do within the family uh, the opportunity uh, to uh, have this business. God bless you. I wish uh, my father's uh, business had been successful, and then maybe I would be a, a tycoon and a mogul back in L.A., and I wouldn't That makes two of us. Job. But I think it's, uh, if you're going to personalize it, if you're going to personalize it one way, let's understand, let's personalize it the other. This gentleman, chair, time is this chair, I move to strike the last word. Chairman. For what purpose the gentleman from uh, I Oregon move strike the last? I move to strike the last The gentleman's word. recognized for five I, minutes. I, I don't think I ever said that any particular member on either side uh, has or not met the payroll. 
I don't know why we had to make this personal. I can just tell you that uh, uh, when my parents decided to retire, uh, they offered us the opportunity to buy the business at a market rate, at a cash flow rate that was industry standard, I can assure you. And we set about doing that over 20 years. Um, we also grew the business. We, there were times we didn't even pay ourselves. And that, you know, I, I, I guess in that business as a small market broadcaster in the Dallas and Hood River, you know who our clients were? Were small business people. That's who advertises. And it gives you a really unique perspective to work day in and day out with people who are just like you trying to figure out how to achieve an American dream, how to risk their own capital, how to work their tails off. You know, in small business, you get to set all your own hours, all of them, day and night in some cases. And sometimes you succeed and sometimes you fail. And that's what America's really all about. But when you've got every day you're trying to deal with employment issues, you're trying to deal with competition, you're trying to deal with your own product and improvement and keep everything running. And then you get this uncertainty of government regulation. And I'm just telling you, as I go around and continue to talk to my friends in the small business world, they're saying, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know with the, the president's health care reform proposal what that's really going to mean to me. I'm trying to set up because I know those are going to phase in in a couple of years. Do I expand now? Don't I? How am I going to be affected? What are the rates going to be? When, when, I'm, when I'm looking, at, I talked to a guy this weekend who's planning a $3 million expansion of his, his business. It's a, it's a co-op. And between new EPA rules on, on fuel that may be coming, it may affect all the tanks he just put in, uh, it's probably been 10 years now, to deal with the leaking underground hazardous uh, or leaking underground tanks. And th where he thought he had like a 30-year life on those, he now may have to pull them out and put new ones in. And that may come before his plan to, to make some other changes. And so now he's trying to figure out, can I even cash flow this thing? And, and it's just one thing after another after another. And it is that uncertainty, and, and it does cost jobs. And, and I guess that's, uh, as, as I get out, and maybe I'm unique out around my district, but I don't think I am. It is the heartbeat of America is small business. And that's certainly in a district like mine, that you get one job at a time, two jobs at a time. Maybe you get a big company shows up, that's great. But the core of our economy in rural Oregon and in rural America, these little mom and pop businesses, and uh, if, if they, but some of these guys don't even make minimum wage if they really actually calculated the hours they put into their own business. Um, but they do it because they believe in it. And uh, I just want to see an America where uh, the government isn't the enemy. And, and none of us is talking about increasing pollution and doing all this stuff. I, I, you know, that, that, we all want clean water, clean air and all that. I sit in my hometown of Hood River and, and because of, uh, in, in some measure, the lack of our ability to actively manage our federal forest lands, we're choking on smoke right now. Far more smoke than, smoke than any plant puts out, I'll tell you, because of these forest fires uh, that are burning away and, and threatening watersheds, including Portland's uh, Bull Run watershed. And, and it's just one thing after another, and I'm just sick of it, and, and I'm going to do something about it. And, uh, and, and you don't, you know, we can, and we can do it logically, we can do it thoughtfully, and, and we're doing that with this legislation, and I yield back. Gentleman, you? I, I would. I yield back, but I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman. I thank Congress. you for yielding. I respect you, and I understand what you're saying and the sincerity in what you're saying. It, But my point is, that we need to work together because I think it is an unreal universe when we think the only problems are the regulations. We need to get people working. We need to develop the economy. We need to be mindful of these toxic air pollutants. And we have to, I believe also, and I know you, many will disagree with me, that some of those uh, climate problems that are causing this country so much, pro so much distress is due to the fact that we're not acting to reduce greenhouse gases. So let, let us figure out what the facts are and what we can do to help businesses succeed. If these regulations don't go into effect, what those small businesses are experiencing, they'll continue to experience until we get this economy going again. I thank you for yielding. Is there anyone seeking recognition Chairman. to speak on the Rush Amendment? I am. Uh, gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Barton is recognized for five minutes. Well, I'm going to speak briefly on the Rush Amendment in that I oppose it. 
I think it's unnecessary. I, I, I appreciate my uh, Chicago Bear supporter <laughs> for offering it, but I, I won't be able to. I do want to uh, say some kind words to the ranking member, Mr. Waxman. I've been in his shoes. It's no fun. You know you're going to get beat every day you show up. You look over here, and we got, I think, 13 or 14 votes, and you look around, and you've got two, four now, that the Calvary's arrived with Mr. Inslee, and, you know, Mr. Good Friend from New York. But I want my good friend on the minority to know that those of us in the majority, we're not put postulating these bills just because we can. We're trying to address real problems. My friend from Oregon's got a real problem. The, the forest products industry in his state's been decimated by the, some of these environmental rules that have already been promulgated. In my congressional district, yesterday, because of a proposed cross-state air pollution rule that's been proposed by the EPA that Texas was not even included in until they put the final rule out, uh, the major power generator in our state announced layoffs of 500 people. The cement industry ruled that some of this legislation today before us uh, affects. I've got three cement plants in my district, and in all probability, if the proposed EPA rule goes into effect, two to 300 jobs will be lost there. Those are real jobs. Those, that's not some hypothetical preventable premature death five years from now, those are real jobs. Now, every member of this committee on the majority side that was in Congress in the early 90s voted for the Clean Air Act amendments. I was a sponsor of it under Chairman Dingell's direction, and I think you were health subcommittee chairman at that time. You know, there is such a thing as the law of diminishing returns. If you've never regulated anything, the first time you put a rule in, you're going to get a huge benefit, or you should. The second time you tighten it, you should get some benefit. We're now down in the Clean Air Act on some of these proposed rules that, that by their own admission, the quantitative benefit is, is very, fairly small, and it's justified by the same old tired methodology that you're somehow going this minute increase or decrease in emission is going to have a huge health benefit. That just defies common sense. And so these particular bills today are saying, let's take a step back. Let's give them a little bit more time. Let's ask them to go back and really look at them. And uh, if, they put a, if they still want to do a rule, let's do a rule that can actually be implemented with real technology in the real world. That's not, you know, some draconian gutting of, of, of the existing law. So, you know, when, when Mr. Walden starts talking about real-world effects, I think he's being sincere. I also think former chairman and current ranking member Waxman is being sincere and that, that he really wants us to take a deep breath and, and think about these things. But we're proposing them because we have we think they're real world consequences if we just let the EPA go unchecked and we're trying to as as, as Congress's in purpose is, you know, clarify the laws that we passed in the in the in the past. And with that I, I oppose the Rush Amendment and yield back. Chairman yields back to time. Mr. Chairman. Is there further discussion? Chairman amendment? Uh, for what purpose the gentleman of California strike said, the last word gentleman's recognized five yeah <laughs> mr chairman <clears throat> i'm sorry the gentleman from california um you know personalized this issue but let me just say i my background is not at um making the payrolls my background is being the regulatory agency that puts the burden on the business community and i sure do not understand what it's going to take to get some people in this town to understand the accumulative impact on the ability or the legality of people staying in business in this country is what we're talking about. You know, 
the ranking member ought to look at uh, just in California. Let me give you two examples in California. This isn't, isn't just businesses, but this is environmental strategies that are being blocked by government regulation. Number one, the scientists who were paid for by the state of California worked in Scripps Institution, in a California institution, paid for with taxpayers' money. When they developed a green fuel that could help reduce greenhouse gases, they had to leave the state of California to be able to create a legal vehicle to produce the green fuel. They went to New Mexico. Why? Because under California CEQA, they could not legally cite the production facility within a decade. This is not people who want to destroy the environment or kill children. These are people who want to save the environment. But because the accumulative impact of regulatory oversight, it has blocked it. When the Aptera car, 200, um, 200 miles to the gallon car, is asking for a grant from the Obama administration to go into production. The Obama administration made the condition of the production of that car was not to be done in the state of California because of the regulatory obstructionism of the state of California. They required to get the federal grant for a 200 a mile a gallon car have to leave a state because of the government obstructionism. So anybody that thinks that there is not a huge impact of government regulation, don't talk to the business guy. Come to those of us who have actually been in those regula regulatory agencies and seen the impact. And so I just want to point out that let's admit there's a huge impact on the private sector to be able to do, create jobs. And let's admit that the crisis facing America today is not the emissions from a boiler plant or from a, um, a um, uh, cement factory. The crisis is out there facing the average working person who desperately needs their government to get the hell out of the way and allow the private sector to provide them a job. And we're not brave enough to admit that government is a part of the problem. If we're not brave enough to confront the fact that we need to change the way government does oversight on regulatory agencies to create those opportunities for the public, then we are not worth being able to be to, uh, not worth staying here and saying we represent the public. We can implement environmental strategies, but priorities have to be made. And this bill reflects the crisis that the American people are facing, and especially the blue collar. And the environmental risk may be higher among the working class when we don't clean up the problem. But the economic disaster rests on the working class much more than those who are wealthy. And so I think this, this amendment is well-intentioned, but missed time and inappropriate this time. And I yield back. Would, you, would the gentleman yield? Yeah, I will yield. Yeah. Uh, and I, can, I hear your arguments, and on the surface, your arguments seem to make some sense. But this is the wrong bill, the wrong time, the wrong place for us to consider jobs, in that uh, real jobs, and jobs that would really have an effect. If, in fact, we're concerned, you're concerned uh, about job creation, if you're concerned about job creation in, in, in the cement industry, then it seems as though you would be waving the flag, you'll be rallying around the American Jobs Act to increase... Reclaiming increase, my time. Reclaiming my time. Look, more. The ranking member's got to recognize there is more than writing blank checks and borrowing money but, that we need to do. We need to get the regulations to make it... Wait, reclaiming my time... Mr. If you Chairman, just you. The gentleman from California has the time. Mr. Chairman, even the president admitted that what he thought was shovel ready was not ready, and the reason why it was re not ready because the government had not given the permits to allow people to produce the jobs, and even the president admitted he underestimated that impact. The gentleman's time has expired. If there's no further discussion, the, the vote would occur on the but, Rush Amendment. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment uh, was not agreed to. This time, the chair will call up H. Oh, well, oh, yeah, we need. are there any further amendments, first of all, to 2681? Okay. 
Well, at this time, the vote will now occur on the legislation 2681. All those support the uh, leg all those oppose the legislation, no. <laughs> yeah, y'all got me so uh, confused right now that I did it the, op uh, the, the opposite of what I was supposed to do. So l let's say 20, uh, let's do HR 2681 once again. All those in favor of this legislation signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed this legislation signify by saying no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. So the legislation is agreed to. And at this time, the chair would call up H.R. 2250 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 2250, <coughs> to provide additional time for the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered. In keeping with the chairman's policy, uh, are there any bipartisan amendments? Mr. Chairman. Are there any amendments at all? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment that, I, again, I'm uh, eternally uh, uh, faithful that ultimately there will be a bipartisan amendment that will uh, pass out of this subcommittee, but I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman, Mr. Rush, will the clerk report the amendment? Which number, Mr. Rush? What is the number of the amendment? It's an amendment. It's an amendment for 2250. It's the only amendment that I have for 20, 2250. Yeah. Amendment to HR 2250 offered by Mr. Rush. Mm -hmm. Without objection, first reading of the amendment is uh, is dispensed with, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to speak in support of his amendment. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, boilers and incinerators are one of the largest industrial sources of mercury pollution and other hazardous air pollutants in the U.S. That's why the Clean Air Act requires EPA to set emission limits for these facilities based on how much pollution uh, they can reduce using available technology. This is a prudent approach and one that has worked well. EPA has significantly reduced toxic air pollution from numerous uh, industrial sectors in the past two decades. Until recently, boilers and incinerators have had a free pass. This year, the EPA finally took action to require these facilities to reduce their emissions of mercury and other toxic pollutants that cause cancer. This bill stops uh, those public health protections in their tracks. The bill also rewrites the way EPA sets emission limits for toxic pollution and make it harder to achieve meaningful reduction. Section 5 of the bill is of particular concern. It puts new constraints and conditions on how and when EPA can set specific <coughs> emission standards for toxic pollution. It also requires EPA to select the least burdensome option when looking at how to cut pollution. But the bill doesn't explain what this means. Does this mean that because work practice standards are the least stranded regulatory option, that's all that the EPA can ever require? Or does it mean uh, that where the Clean Air Act provides discretion, the agency should choose workplace practice standards? These are two distinct legal interpretations of the language, and it's unclear what this bill would require. At the hearing last week, Jenna McCarthy from EPA testified that this section is un unclear and could raise, quote, legal uncertainty, end of quote, and I agree. I'm also concerned that it could do more than create new litigation. I fear that this language could require the EPA to lower the bar for reduction of toxic air pollution. Rather than require the most polluting facilities to do more to reduce their toxic emissions, EPA could just require everyone to do less. From that standpoint, uh, the standpoint of public health, that is totally unacceptable. 
this amendment clarifies that 65 of the bill will not uh, gut the Clean Air Act. It is not intended to gut the Clean Air Act, and it never will gut the Clean Air Act. It simply states that the language in this section supplements but does not replace the requirement that EPA set specific emissions limits based on the best technology on the market, unless such limits are not feasible. This amendment will help create the certainty that the industry says it wants and ensures that the EPA can do what it's supposed to do, and that is to protect the public health. Mr. Chairman, I would urge all my colleagues to support this bipartisan amendment. Gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffiths, recognized for five minutes to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask everyone to vote against the amendment. I believe that the amendment would create confusion for the EPA because the agency would have to choose between existing language in the statute and Congress's clarifications in this bill that the standards being set are achievable in practice by real-world facilities. In my opening statement, I referenced the actual uh, language in uh, the code that references the 12 percent. The original standard was you've got to look at what 12 percent of the industry is doing in order to be achievable, and you can go lower than that. The power was given to the administrator to go lower than that, but what the administrator and the EPA have done in this case and, and, and in the preceding bill is they've actually gone way below the 12 percent that was anticipated by Congress. Nobody wanted litigation over the exact percentage, but we ended up with a situation where we're at about 2 percent of the uh, industry that, that may be able to meet some of this, they may not be able to meet all of it, as was previously stated. And many of the arguments are the same on this amendment as the preceding amendment on the pre previous bill, uh, because what we have instead, because of what we believe to be misinterpretation by the courts, the EPA is following a pollutant by pollutant approach and setting standards that cannot be met by real world boilers. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the Franken boiler or the Franken plant or the Franken macked uh, situation, but we've heard from employer after employer that says they cannot meet these standards without laying off workers uh, for a period of time or without closing facilities. And we believe that uh, both with the boiler macked and with the preceding uh, legislation, about 20 percent, if we don't take action, about 20 percent of the workforce in those areas will be impacted uh, considerably if not having the jobs lost. And in these economic times, we, we clearly all want to make sure that we have sound science and health, but we also want to have jobs. And, in, and it's interesting that the health issue always comes up because predominantly when you look at this, there's an extrapolation. The models just don't fit. Uh, Representative Barton touched on that. The models don't fit what the EPA is saying. So we're going to sacrifice jobs. We're not willing to take the time to make sure we get the rules right if we adopt this amendment. And I believe, Mr. Chairman, that we should not adopt this amendment, that what we have is clear. I made that point in the testimony last week, that when you read the, the clear meaning and the clear meaning of the words in the Section 5, it's pretty clear what it says. And I believe that that helps business and helps us come up with real-world solutions to real-world pro problems that are, in fact, achievable. And I would ask that everyone vote no on the Rush Amendment. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the Rush Amendment. Congress create, created Section 112 of the Clean Air Act to direct EPA to control toxic air pollution using readily available technology. This section requires EPA to develop emission limits for power plants, boilers, cement kilns, and other facilities that release mercury, dioxins, and other dangerous chemicals in the air. The Clean Air Act takes a very prudent approach. It says that EPA should set emission limits based on the emission levels already being achieved by similar facilities. These regulations are known as the Maximum Achievable Control Technology, or MACT, standards. For existing sources, EPA bases the, st the emission standards on the average emissions achieved by the best performing 12 percent of facilities not the top 1 or 2 percent, the top 12. Section 5 of this bill has a potential to gut these requirements. I say potential because the intent of the language is unclear. Section 5 of the bill requires EPA to set emission standards that can be met 
under actual operating conditions consistently and concurrently with emission standards for all other air pollutants. It also requires EPA to select the least burdensome regulatory alternative, even if a more stringent standard is feasible and would provide greater public health protection. At the hearing last week, Gina McCarthy from EPA testified that this section could raise legal uncertainty. She warned that industry could argue that this new language modifies or supersedes provisions of the Clean Air Act designed to achieve maximum reductions in toxic air pollution. John Walke from the Natural Resources Defense Council was more direct in his testimony. He stated that Section 5 would require EPA to cater to the lowest common denominator and set emission standards based on the most polluting boilers or incinerators rather than the best performing facilities. So at best, this section creates legal uncertainty and more litigation. At worst, it guts the core of the Clean Air Act. The Rush Amendment clarifies the intention of this language. It simply states that the language in this section supplements but does not replace the requirement that EPA set numeric emissions limits based on the best performing emissions reduction technology unless such limits are not feasible. This amendment would help create the certainty that industry says it wants and avoid additional litigation about congressional intent. As I understand uh, Mr. Griffith's comments, he seemed to be concerned about the standards being select, set for pollutant by pollutant and uh, then taking the uh, maximum achievable control technology for these pollutants rather than the best plants. Well, that could mean that they are good on one pollutant but bad on another. And uh, we want to make sure that when they take the, the, the efforts to meet the standards that are already being achieved, that we not let them weaken what they're doing or weaken what they should be doing to protect in other pollutant area. This is what the Clean Air Act says. The matter was litigated. One side lost. The side that lost has come in and asked us to re remedy their loss. But in remedying their loss, I think it's going to be a situation where we end up with more uncertainty, more litigation. Now, that could be good for the industry that doesn't want to do anything, but it's not good for the purposes of the Clean Air Act, which is to control these pollutants in a prudent, reasonable, common sense way so that we can achieve what's good for industry as well as protect the public from some very toxic pollutants. So I would urge support for the, uh, uh, the Rush Amendment. It will provide the certainty the industry says it wants, avoid additional litigation about congressional intent, and I would urge my colleagues to support it. Yield back the time. The chair recognizes himself five minutes to speak against the amendment. Uh, Instead of clarifying, I agree with Mr. Griffith that this amendment would create more ambiguity because of the fact you'd have to choose between the existing language of the bill and the language of this amendment. Also, the Clean Air Act was, uh, last, was adopted in 1990. A lot of things have changed since then, and the legislative process is about correcting problems, and there are a lot of problems we see with the Clean Air Act today. This legislation is not that complicated. It simply gives EPA 15 months to pre-propose, to re-propose and finalize the rules. It extends the compliance period on the boiler section of this uh, uh, bill from three years to five years. Uh, the incinerator regulations are already at five years, so there's not anything particularly unusual about extending the opportunity for compliance to the border to five years. We're also simply addressing the change by EPA in the definition of solid waste, which had not been done before. We're trying to correct that problem. And then we're also trying to address this so-called Franken plant issue in which the EPA is changing the way that they deal with that. So I think this legislation is certainly not radical. I think it's reasonable. And for that reason, I would speak in opposition to the Rush Amendment and ask that it not be 
um, adopted. Are there anyone seek recognition? Question is now on the Rush Amendment. Uh, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed signify by saying nay. No. no. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Are there additional amendments to H.R. 2250? For what purpose, the gentleman from Washington? Have an amendment. The gentleman uh, has an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk report the amendment? Amendment to H.R. 2250 offered by Mr. Inslee of Washington. Without objection, the first reading of the amendment is uh, dispensed with, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to speak in favor of his amendment. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm offering this amendment, which I think makes some uh, reasonable improvements to the circumstances that the biomass industry faces under these proposed rules. Uh, this amendment simply would give EPA until next April to review the comments submitted by the public and industry and work towards revisions that will make the rule more workable. The EPA has received hundreds of these comments in itself, I think, uh, recognizes that this would be beneficial to be able to digest and incorporate uh, all of the public's uh, advice considering this complicated rule. It's a reasonable approach to give the EPA more time uh, to consider issues uh, impacting these relevant industries. They've said they uh, need more time uh, to consider issues relating to major source emissions from industrial, commercial, and institutional boilers and process heaters. Uh, by our amendment would not apply to the, to the, uh, to the fourth character, uh, uh, characterized uh, uh, situations. They give them time to better establish rules with commercial and industrial solid waste incineration units, which I believe need a closer review because they should not be the same rules that regulate biomass boilers. But the important thing about our approach under this amendment is it would, in fact, uh, in fact have a deadline for action by EPA. And I think this is very important. Under the existing bill, this puts... Uh, Americans' health into the to the netherland of uh, perhaps never being dealt with, and we know that that can happen, and this would leave uh, the health of Americans at the tender mercies of whoever whoever ends up being in the White House in the next four years or afterwards, and that is something we have learned uh, not to be entirely uh, confident that science would be followed. In fact, uh, in this upcoming debate, there's really believe we an issue whether or not there is going to be candidates on both sides that want to follow good science uh, rather than politics. So we think it's very important to maintain some deadline at the same time recognize the complexity of this rule and making sure that the public's uh, interest uh, can be uh, accommodated. Uh, and I commend this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone seek recognition to speak in opposition to the amendment? Gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, looking at the amendment, I'm trying to figure out exactly all of what it does, but, but I believe that what it does is that it still it inserts the date of April 13, 2012 for the enactment or for the, um, uh, the, the, the final uh, promulgation of the rules. It then goes on to strike some other things, but, but that does not, I believe, give the EPA sufficient time because they originally asked for 15 months, and even though the 15 months has been running uh, from their testimony last week on part of the bill, it has not been running, even if you just limit it to the 15 months, it has not been running, Mr. Chairman, on the other parts of the bill, in which case the EPA would have to start that section up. Uh, their reports and studies on that section uh, would have to start anew, and their original request for that was 15 months, putting a, a date of no later than April 13, 2012, does not, I believe, comply in toto. It may own part of what the EPA says they need. It does not in toto uh, apply to what the EPA said they need. Further, as I have stated in my opening statement and have said repeatedly, I believe we need to make sure we get this right, that it doesn't hurt us to take more time to make sure we get these rules right. Just as I said in my opening, you know, if we don't get the rules right, the money that these institutions are going to have to spend on boilers, et cetera, 
are not reversible. If we then come back in later and decide that we have to change those rules again, and the jobs that are lost are also not reversible. And there are a lot of places who feel that they need additional time uh, to com to study and work on this, and I don't believe that these amendments do it, and therefore I would request that the amendment uh, offered by the gentleman from Washington be rejected. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Speak in favor of the amendment. The gentleman is recognized five minutes. I support Mr. Inslee's amendment, which addresses two of my many concerns with this bill. This amendment gives EPA a deadline for issuing the rules. The Clean Air Act deadline for these rules was 11 years ago in the year 2000. These rules are 11 years late despite a statutory deadline that can be enforced in court after diligent enforcement by communities suffering from air toxics. What in, the, in this history suggests that we will achieve these pollution reductions by prohibiting EPA from issuing the rules during this presidential term and then eliminating any statutory deadline for ever issuing the rules. The boiler rule bill before us virtually guarantees we won't see these reductions for years and likely decades. And make no mistake, toxic air pollution harms Americans and especially infants and children. Every day across America, parents are forced to watch helplessly as their children slowly die from cancer. Some of those cancers are caused by entirely preventable air pollution. How can we stand by and let this continue unabated? We know mercury damages the developing neurological system. At high levels, it literally makes adults who work with mercury as mad as hatters. Exposure to mercury at low levels damages the development of babies' brains, even in the womb. Each year in this country, roughly 60,000 babies are exposed to harmful levels of mercury. Yet the bills before us today would indefinitely delay any requirement to clean up two of the three largest sources of mercury pollution in this country. That's shameful. This amendment also leaves the so-called area source rule for smaller boilers in place. According to EPA, no one petitioned them to stay and replace that rule. For the vast majority of area sources, the EPA regulation now in effect simply requires the owners to tune up the boilers each year or every other year. That will save fuel and reduce pollution. I can't imagine a more reasonable or less burdensome requirement. There's no reason to nullify these rules, and that's what H.R. 2250 does. This amendment wouldn't fix all the other ways this bill would allow boilers to continue to emit toxic air pollution unabated, but it, it says that we need regulations to reduce toxic air pollution, and we expect EPA to issue the revised rules by a, a date certain, and it gives EPA all the time they want to get the rules right. I urge my colleagues to support this common sense amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chair recognizes himself for five minutes speaking opposition to the amendment. We've heard a lot of discussion today that um, these regulations were expected to be finalized many years ago. And the only reason I might say these rules are not currently in place is because of lawsuits from environmental groups. EPA's own schedule call for the agency to issue maximum achievable control technology rules for boilers in 2004, which the agency did. And sources were on track to comply. But environmentalists challenged the rules and they were vacated in 2007. Now EPA has proposed new boiler rules. And environmentalists have again challenged those rules. So in my view, this legislation, H.R. 2250, will provide an orderly path toward the finalizing achievable, defensible, and protective rules for boilers that can be implemented. And so for that reason, I would uh, oppose the amendment and ask uh, other members not to support it. And with that, I'd yield back the balance of my time. Are there additional people seeking recognition to speak in favor of the amendment or against the amendment? If there's no further discussion, the vote will occur on the amendment. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. 
Are there further amendments uh, for H.R. 2250? If there are no further amendments, the question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 2250. All those in favor shall signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion, the ayes have it in, in the opinion of the chair, and the bill is favorably reported. And without objection, the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the bill approved by the subcommittee today. So ordered, and the subcommittee stands adjourned.